Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Trocum. We are back for another uh, Lost Tracks of IndyCar edition with my friend Frank Santoroski here. Frank, how you doing tonight? Very well. How are you, ma'am? I'm good, man. I'm ready to uh, talk another local, uh, local to me track in, in Langhorn Speedway. Uh, for those who don't know, I will give a quick recap before I let Frank jump in here. Uh, Langhorn opened in 1926, closed in 1927, had some stock car races, uh, obviously open wheels, some motorcycle races, and uh, was uh, about four miles from where I grew up. Uh, most of my life. So with that, Frank, where do you want to start? The Langhorn was interesting in the fact that the Speedway had no straightaways. It was it was nearly a perfect circle. Now now they had what they called turn one, turn two, turn three, turn four, but it was, it was really just a quadrant of the, of a track, almost like if you took a pizza and made the first two cuts of the pizza before you made the the other two to make eight pieces, cut it into four pieces. That would be your turn one, turn two three, four. Um, but Langhorn developed a reputation as being very dangerous um, and over, the, over the years, and it, it kept that reputation uh, for years and years. I believe there were 27 to 28 fatalities uh, and, and numerous other uh, injuries. Uh, some of this was related to the track. Uh, you know, other, others were related to, you know, the, the safety conditions at the time. You know, a lot of... Uh, you know, through the the 50s and 60s, one of the biggest things that would uh, injure and kill guys was burns. And that was, you know, not necessarily a symptom of a track, but more of a symptom of a, you know, a fuel tank that would explode and the car would engulf in the flame. And that would, you would see that, you know, across the board in, in, in Formula One and in, in some, some early NASCAR races and in early champ car races. But uh, Langhorne um, operated... Oh, from the you know late 20s up till 1941, when the uh, we went into World War II and all race race tracks were closed then. But then their their real heyday began after 1946. Um, but it was a dirt track, and the the turn two area of the track was in very very swampy ground, and it was always kind of sinking. And it was it was always very wet, and there was always a lot of ruts there. And it was so rough in that part of the track. They a lot of the drivers nicknamed that part of the track Puke Alley, because literally, um, if if you weren't used to that track, you know, drivers would become physically ill. Uh, so, and it was it was the type of track where you because there were no straightaways. It was it was a one big left turn. You were on the gas the whole time. You had to stay committed. So again, you know, it's just a very interesting, very different layout. Uh, but but I've you know I, I've read some quotes from different guys. Uh, I think Bobby Usher was he would say, uh, you know, when they all talk to you, hey, who wants to go to Langhorn? No one will raise their hand. I believe Mario Andretti is quoted saying he never lost sleep before a race. Uh, the first time he went to a track, but he had a tough time before he ran at Langhorn. And and of course all those, you know, Mario and and AJ and and Bobby Usher all. Uh, you know, thrived and won at Langhorn, uh, but a lot of guys didn't make it. A lot of guys didn't make it at a Langhorn. So, yeah, it's funny you mention uh, Puke Alley. Uh, <laughs> terrible, terrible nickname. I I read uh, in my research that the Langhorn guys actually reached out to uh, Indianapolis Motor Speedway and said, oh, "How do we fix this?" And they dug 25 feet deep, put in some concrete, tried to smooth it out. And by the time, I, I guess it was the first race, you know, there was all sorts of, you know, potholes and problems again. And when they dug back down, the swamp land underneath had actually pretty much just swallowed and got rid of the entire, you know, 20 foot concrete slab, which to me is just in, insane to think about. Yeah, they, they, they couldn't find the concrete after they put it in. They, they dug like 25, 30 feet down, and it was just, it just it sunk into the swamp. 
So you, you figure that maybe that wasn't the best place to build a racetrack, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, they, they kept going. And guys that would guys that would win at Langhorn um, was, was some that something you could really hang your hat on. Say, hey, man, I I you know survived this beast, ran at Langhorn, you know, and I won at Langhorn. Um, and and Langhorn hosted um, you know, sprint midget racing. Uh, they they hosted early uh, AAA racing, USAC Championship Trail, as well as the Silver Crown, and they hosted NASCAR races as well. As a matter of fact, the first official season of NASCAR, uh, 1949, I believe, Ryan Warner was on the schedule. Um, but uh, you know those guys didn't find it any any easier than the uh, USAC guys did either. But uh, again, to to win a Langhorne was quite an accomplishment. Yeah, looking at the, you know, AAA winners slash USAC winners, uh, names that pop out for those who uh, are curious, uh, Indy 500 winner, I believe, Rex Mays won in Langhorn in 46. I think that was before it was paved, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, they, they paved the track in 1965. Yep, there we go. Uh, Eddie Sachs won in 58. To the surprise of nobody, AJ Foyt won four out of five years in the early 60s to mid 60s. Mario Andretti, as we mentioned, Lloyd Ruby, uh, and then the last two were Bobby Unser. So some some great winners on an insane track. I'm definitely gonna have to post some pictures of this one uh, on our uh, on our show notes for everybody to see how insane this uh, this. Kind of looks like to me, just looking at a picture, it's like almost a football, but more circular. Yeah, yeah. The the, the initial outlay was there was a little flat part on the uh, on the, the west side of the track, but but largely it was a circle, and there was absolutely no banking. It was totally flat, which which means you had to you know you didn't have uh, any any help of banking to get you into that corner. It was all it, it was it was all in your arm strength there. So. Now, when they did pave the track in 65, they reconfigured it. Uh, they made it more of kind of like a D shape, um, almost looked like a bit of a kind of a convoluted square. You know, the, the track lost a lot of character there, but but then it was it was considered a bit, bit, a bit safer. It was paved, you know, so you didn't have the puke alley sinking down with all the ruts. You had, a, a you know, true straightaways here and there. Uh, that lasted until the 70s. But one of the things that <laughs> contributed to the downfall, uh, the eventual downfall of uh, Langhorn was the fact that the track changed ownership so many times. The 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 original owner was, uh, oh, uh, the original promoter was Pappy. Now, see, now, now I'm trying to remember his name. Pappy Hank Wilcox. Hankinson. Pappy Hankinson, yeah. And they, they he was there before they closed for the war. And then, then afterwards it was... Uh, Pat Bab Babcock uh, bought the track. In between, there was another guy that bought the track and died right away. And so, but it was the um, the the later promoters, Irv. Uh, you see, I had all this written down. Irv Geisler and uh, his partner uh, were were in charge of promoting the races, and they were able to to draw some great crowds there. But again, in 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 later years, as and now Langhorn, we didn't mention. The geographic location is just north of Philadelphia, and like a lot of these tracks near big cities, the urban sprawl and the boom in the bigger cities in the in the in the late '60s and early '70s caused those the real estate to be more lucrative to be redeveloped than to host a racetrack. So that's a, you know that's a a common story that you can say you know you know Riverside, Trenton. Ontario, all those tracks suffer that same fate. But uh, at the same time, Langhorn, with the the constant swapping of, of owners, it didn't do them any favors. Yeah, the uh, the area where the track is in is is right near a the, one of the bigger state uh, local uh, public high schools. The developments that went up there with all the you know cookie cutter homes of the day pretty much took over the entire area. So. It was uh, a foregone conclusion that once those houses st started going up in the in the '60s, I think it was, is when Langhorn, the town, was incorporated. That it was only a only a matter of time, in my opinion. Oh yeah, that's you know again, if you don't, you know the um, you look at uh, you know, profit versus loss, and the track been there a long time, and it, and it's sad. There's a lot of 
you know, great tracks across the country that have, that are just, and there's just no trace of them left, you know. Um, then there's others like, say, North Wilkesboro, where the whole track is just closing and sitting there because the um, <laughs> story I read there, that the, uh, the cost to redevelop the property was more than it was worth, uh, which is interesting uh, with small town tracks. So, uh, but I mean, but back to Langhorn, the interesting thing is, and I just, I just totally lost my train of thought. I'm sorry, Mike, but uh, here I'll jump in with something. Yeah, while yeah, you, uh... go, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so you can tell we're un unscripted. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, these are uh, a little bit looser than our our regular episode. Uh, if you happen to be in the area, there's a Sam's Club, a Restaurant Depot, and a CarMax, and you can tell. Uh, that's where the that's where the pits and the grandstands were. Uh, there's actually a little bit of a wooded area uh, near that that Sam's Club, uh, which would have had the infield and backstretch. So, uh, as a result, there's no actual physical track itself left, minus the historical mar marker that you you know mentioned before. And I, I think the the best nickname for the track. Uh, I don't know who coined this nickname, but the big left turn. Uh, if there is ever a more appropriate track nickname, that that definitely has to be it. Uh, as you mentioned, the original layout with no banking and essentially a giant circle. Uh, definitely, it's one one long left turn. I can see that making drivers uh, pretty dizzy in the end, and obviously the bumps did not help. But one thing I wanted to ask about was you actually interviewed uh, Mel Kenyon uh, just the other day, and he's got a pretty, pretty interesting, not only you know racing background in general, but uh, was actually uh, somewhat of a victim of Langhorne Speedway back in the day. Yeah, yeah, Mel had a pretty bad crash at Langhorne. It was it was actually the paved version of of Langhorne after it was paved. It was early in Mel's career, and he again, like we talked about the fire, the car burst into flames, and then Joe Leonard, uh, you know, pulled his car over, tried to pull Mel out. Two spectators in in what Mel said, a couple of guys in jeans and t-shirts, came in there too, tried to pull him out of the car. And the biggest stumbling block was the fact that, um, you know, back then steering wheels weren't removable. You know, this day and age, we're used to seeing a guy pop the steering wheel off. Uh, back then, you, you really couldn't do that. So it was a little harder to get the guy out of the car if he was injured, you know, and he couldn't get himself out of the car. So, but then, then the fire got to be too big and the guys trying to pull him out had to back off until the safety truck got there with some some water cans and, and were able to put the fire out, then they they were able to get him out. Now, uh, Mel was burned over 60% of his body. Um, he lost all the fingers on his left hand and his thumb. Uh, he's just, he's, uh, if you ever meet Mel, he's just got that, that little nub of a hand there. Uh, and yet it, he, he was back in a race car in a couple of months after they said he was going to be out for a while. Now he, he, he contributes, um, his Christian beliefs a lot to uh, his recovery, but at the same time, I, I just think there's something in the psyche of a race car driver that, that these guys are like super athletes. I mean, how many times have we seen a guy that they give him the timetable for recovery and then he's, he's, he's back in a car before you, you know, b before projected to, and we've seen this with Bourdais, we've seen this with Hinchcliffe. Um, and of course with Mel Kenyon, but, uh, yeah, it was a pretty devastating, he, you know, he could have burned to death right there. Uh, he could have stopped racing forever, but instead, you know, being the, having that racer spirit where I, you know, I just want to race his, his brother helped him design a special glove with a grommet and a little hook to hook on the steering wheel. So he can, uh, you know, sort of, sort of grip that steer when it was left hand and primarily use his right hand for for the steering motion so um you know again a uh, horrible uh, crash there for mel but then again this guy kept driving into his 70s you know and uh end up you know winning oh nearly 400 midget feature races seven championships and he's in like four different hall of fames now so uh, it, was, it was awesome talking to mel last night it's like you don't often talk to a, a guy of that caliber and when you talk about the, you know, the, 
how the early race car drivers were, were true tough guys. And that's something you hear like Robin Miller say a lot. Oh, the tough guys in racing. Yeah. Mel Kenny is the true tough guy of racing. Yeah. He actually uh, finished third in the Indy 500. I think one of his what, seven or eight attempts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He ran, he ran eight times at Indy he finished in the top five, um, four times and had a, had a third place, I believe on his second attempt. Yeah. So, and, and the funny thing about Mel is cause I, I, in anticipation of the interview, I watched a lot of old film, and I noticed that he drives the Sprint Midget car a whole lot differently than he drove the Indy car. And um, so he would he was aggressive as all get out in the Midget car. He would just he would knock you out of the way to get to the lead. Um, at the Indy 500, this dude was smooth and consistent and perfect, and didn't drive beyond the uh, limit of the car. And that that worked well for him too but you just see how smart of a guy he was knowing that you can throw that midget around a little bit but but you know when you get to a place like indianapolis and uh, with a car with a lot more horsepower and, and a lot more cars on the track uh, you need to respect that and, and he has some great finishes so i'm going to completely change gears here because i was rereading my notes and i completely skipped a line the, the the gentleman who owned a track for the track for about a year probably not even uh Earl yeah, the, the stunt, Lucky Teeter. Yeah. Stunt, stunt, stunt man, yeah. Yeah, he crashed his rocket car leap stunt actually at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Uh, so tying back to Indiana there. But uh, wow, I don't, even, I don't know what a rocket car leap stunt is, but it sounds pretty insane. It, it sounds like Evil Knievel's. Um, you know, Snake Canyon jump many, many years before <laughs> before his time. Yeah. So, but yeah, this guy, that guy picked up the ownership of the track after the war, and you know, a, a year later he was gone, which created the void. Uh, that's and that's where the Babcock family came on in, and then they brought in uh, uh, Irvin them to to promote. So, but yeah, that's that's an odd little story too, if you think about. You know the, the the types of things you would see at a state fair. Somebody doing a a jump in a rocket car. Yeah, I uh, that that one caught me off guard. And I'm glad I actually went back to to find it. But uh, I'll wrap it up with a couple kind of little interesting facts here. It was actually a hundred lap race for the first I don't know five to ten years uh, on Labor Day. So it was almost like. Uh, you know, a, a little local holiday uh, event here in the in the Pennsylvania area, which is uh, you know kind of neat. Uh, obviously, by the time I was born, there was there was nothing left. Let me see what else I can find here. Obviously, I ran NASCAR. The motorcycles actually ran in the 30s to the 50s. So the mo motorcycles ran there when it was completely unpaved, which to me is just mind boggling. I don't know too much about the motorcycle racing world especially back then, but I imagine there was, uh, it was pretty just, you know, just as dangerous as a, as a champ car. Oh, certainly. And yeah. I've watched some flat track motorcycle racing, which is current, you know, goes on today. There's a, uh, a horse track up here in Lexington, Kentucky, where I live that hosts the flat track motorcycles. And that's just insane. But I can imagine it at a place like, um, Langhorn where it's so muddy and ruddy and, 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 you know, there was several motorcyclers lost their lives at Langhorn as well. So it was equally as dangerous for them, if not more so, because, you know, you don't fall off of your Indy car, but you, you sure can't get thrown off of a, a motorcycle. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> it's a very good way of putting it. So listen, Frank, we will wrap up our uh, Langhorn uh, edition here. We'll probably title this episode, the big left turn. Uh, seating capacity was 60,000 at our little local Langhorn Speedway. Also went by the name of New Philadelphia Speedway and Philadelphia Speedway, despite being, well, roughly about 45 minutes outside the city. So, uh, any last words about Langhorn Speedway? Well, I mean, the other, the other nickname that we didn't mention was, it's, they call it the track that ate the heroes. You know, which well, I is, like that, even though yeah. it's kind of morbid, I like that. Yeah, it's kind of more. But even if you think about, you know, the fact that it ate the concrete, this and that, like it's a big monster, you know. So, but uh, yeah, it's 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 big, big and bad, and scary. But the guys that conquered it, I mean, always have that to hang their hat on. So, 
Cool. Well, again, Frank, thank you very much for joining me for another one of these. We will definitely, in a couple of weeks, uh, look at a trek maybe outside of the, the Pennsylvania area here, and we'll go, uh, we'll go something West Coast. But thanks very much for joining. Everybody listening, hope you enjoyed another uh, Lost Tracks of IndyCar episode. And we will be back again in the near future.